they're trapped. Conventional landlords are trapped. They're, they're in a prison. They were sold a bill of goods. They were sold on the Burr like method. We were, like we were. Exactly like I was. They're, they're trapped. And I know people that come on to my stuff now and they convert their existing rentals to slow flips because there's two sides of the slow flip, the buy side and the sell side. Even if you bought it conventionally, you can still do the sell side. Yes. You still can eliminate your monthly repairs, your monthly expenses. You can still eliminate your calls, your turnover. Yeah. You can still eliminate all that even if you have a mortgage yes. and can't pay it off in five years. Yes. Greetings, class. It is so good to see you guys. Greetings to you all tonight. Greetings, class. If you don't mind, I gotta get some energy in here. Please give yourselves a round of applause for being here tonight. Ooh. Clap it up for yourself, please. Thank you, thank you. So I am Chris Haskins. I'm a local real estate entrepreneur. Some beautiful faces, some old faces, some new faces I'm known in here. I've been doing real estate since 2004. And tonight I decided to put this meeting together just to create some synergy, some energy, a little bit of networking for 2024. Is that okay? I know if you're anything like me, you try to forecast your business and try to think about the future and what's going to be happening, start January for you. And tonight, I hopefully we can electrify you to help you go home and just put an action plan together and possibly do something new with your business. And I will be your co-pilot tonight with alongside of my pilot is going to be Scott Jelinek. How you doing? I am fantastic. Thanks for having me. Good to see you, my brother. I might better get a little closer. Check, 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 check. Let me cut you up some. Can y'all hear Scott? Hello, can you hear me? I speak yeah. loud anyway. Screw up, yeah. Okay, good. Scott, I met you when? 2000? I don't know. It's been a couple minutes. It's been a couple of minutes. <laughs> you were just a kid. Had your whole life ahead of you. Now I look at you. <laughs> And I gotta thank my boy Jody. This is his restaurant. Is Joe, Joppo around here anywhere? He's in the bag. I'm, I'm He's working? I'm good. Beautiful. We gotta give a shout out and clap it up for jo Joppo. If it wasn't for him, this would not exist. Uh, Jody, I've been knowing Jody since I was in the music business since in 2004, guys. Well, actually, before that, 2002. And we have done, we rolled back in the whole Teddy Riley days and Men of Vision and doing songs, so now it's come around full circle. Jody has a restaurant and a hotel, so it's, I'm happy to be able to support him and bring the community dollars here to, to support the business. So they got a full restaurant back there, got the menu there, he's got a smoothie bar, he makes all this stuff from scratch, organic stuff, and what else? he's got juices, so those juices are really good, and you can actually get those juices with a little spirit, yeah, who said that? Yeah. <laughs> it's a spirit into it too, so. Joppo, there he is. What's up? Thank you so much. Give a clap it up for Joppo, y'all. Take it. Have a good night. Thank you, brother. I appreciate your time uh, supporting. And, uh, <clears throat> so tonight, we're going to do very briefly a little bit of Q&A. I'm, I'm sorry, Scott and I are going to go back and forth talking about his system and how he's been in the business since, uh, going, is it 30 years? 30 years next year. So just about 30 years. 1994 was my first one. Scott and I are going to go back and forth. And then from the energy you get from Scott, please, we'd like to do some Q&A. That's where the real magic is, to ask this guy a multimillionaire questions that will help you and your business get started, buy your next piece of real estate, possibly help create or build your portfolio or your real estate empire. Because Scott has a system tonight, I believe, that, that is life-changing. I do it. I personally have several of these slow flips that Scott has taught me how to do. And I believe it, it, is, it will be impactful for your life, okay? So not to be off topic, but yes, I can Scott. remember, Chris, I don't know how many years ago it was, you were at a house with me on 18th Street asking me questions, and you were filming. You did a video for your YouTube channel, but I remember you were like, and you're not going to renovate it? And you're going to get how much? And, you, <laughs> and I, remember, I remember that video. You were like, okay. and, and, and you're just going to do it just like this. That's downtown Newport News. Yeah. Okay, yep. yeah, I do remember that. Yeah, I remember the video. Oh, that's cool. You're still doing it. Yep. So let's get started, Scott. I know we talked about something we wanted to just kind of start off. I wanted to do mission. What was your thing, overall point of view, just to help our audience tonight with their businesses before we get into our... So we were talking chat. offline before about mission statement and your mission and your purpose and what it is that you're doing. And, I, and, and it took me years actually kind of to define what the mission was. But what I've come up with, which is what we go with now, is I'm on a mission to help as many people as possible to set themselves free through real estate investing. And... The, the wording there is key because it used to, I used to feel like I was going to set you free through real estate investing and then I realized that I cannot do it. It is to help you set yourself free 
through real estate investing, and that makes all the difference in the world. Yeah, I cannot do it. It's not possible. You, you have that. to. I can teach you. I can train you, but you're the one that has to do it. So I have to. I'm on a mission to help you as many people as possible to set themselves free through real estate investing. So it's almost kind of like going to the gym. Exactly. You can sign up all you want. You can get the best membership, but if you don't do it, nothing's happening. But well, Scott, I want to help. I want to understand what are you, what is free. Or what does that look like for you? Let me check your mic while you're talking. So. Everybody has a different version of what free is. What I consider to be free, and the way I train and the way I teach it is basically we do a, an exercise, a future vision exercise, and come up with what you want your life to look like, your ideal day, your ideal month, your ideal year, and we break it down to a dollar amount, a monthly dollar amount, and then we come up with a plan to reach that dollar amount without you working. And once we attain that, that doesn't mean you're done, it doesn't mean you stop, it doesn't mean it's over, but it means now you can be done, you can stop, and it can be over. You're making enough that you can still live this ideal lifestyle without having to do more deals, without having to do your next flip, without having to go to work. And that's mm. my definition of freedom. It's being able to do whatever it is you want to do, whenever you want to do it, with whoever you want to do it. That's, it. that's freedom to me. Wow. That's good stuff. I remember Scott back in Detroit Titus days. Uh, it was an attorney, local attorney, you know, guy. And he was teaching certain things, trying to maximize the dollar and buying real estate to have negative cash flow for yeah. a year. You remember those days? Yeah. Talk about that a little bit for the people that are kind of relatively new. So it's interesting that you say that because I have conversations almost daily with somebody that knows a better way and a smarter system that will tell me. And it always starts with this. And I used to be in the bar business many years ago, and it would always the sentence always was the same. It was, you know what you need to do if you want to make more money, right? And it's hard to be able to say, I don't want to make more money. I'm always like, you go make more money. You go, you go make more money. Don't worry about me. We're trying to live the best life possible, not make the most money possible. And it's hard, especially when you're starting and you are chasing money, right? And it's hard to be able to say, no, I'm, I'm following this future vision. I am not trying to make the most money if it comes at the cost of my life. I'm trying to live the best life possible, mm. making money in the process. Everybody getting that? Yeah, it's That's challenging. Deep stuff. This deep stuff. I think that is counterintuitive to which, uh, what we're taught, Scott. So I heard, I heard a, a saying, and, and it, I didn't make this up, but I heard it, but I really liked it, and it was saying that we all spend so much time chasing money, right? But money chases value. And so rather than chase money, create value. Create value and the money chases you. And I think about what we do, not just with training, with coaching, but with our slow flips, with our real estate business. We create value in so many different ways that if you even just forget the money, just do what it is that we do, the money is following us. The money is chasing us. And so you don't have to chase money. Create value and the money will chase you. That's so cool. My wife, I never, I haven't worked for money. It's been probably 25 years. And when I met my wife, I, 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 sometimes people would hire me to do sound gigs. And the first thing she would ask me, what are they paying? I forget to ask. Yeah. I would forget to ask, Scott. It's almost like it's something that is uh, the personalities. Talk about working for money and just the mindset that you have. Well, my wife's here, and I tell you, and she, she used to ask me, this is years ago, way before I was ever doing coaching or training or anything like that, I would meet with somebody who I was more or less coaching or training, but they, I didn't have a program, and, and I'm helping them to do deals, and sometimes mm -hmm. I would come home and she would say, well, well, how much are you gonna make on that deal? And I'm like, well, <laughs> nothing, but I was still excited about it, and I enjoyed it, and, and that's kind of what led me to realize I enjoy doing coaching, I enjoy doing training. But I remember we would get home and I would talk about, oh, I helped them get this deal, and they're gonna do this and that, and she'd be like, well, how much are you gonna make on it? I'm like, well, nothing, but, <laughs> but, I, but I liked it. <laughs> the wives. Yeah. The wives get right to the point. At that job I was talking about, I was making seven dollars an hour. It was crazy. So they bring you home, right? And you're making nothing. Wow. All right. So that was just our little thing over top. So tonight, uh, the the main reason tonight, Scott has a system, and he's got some goodies he's going to give away in a minute. A system that allows you to set yourself up for free, for freedom. And Scott has been in the business, I already said, uh, almost 30 years. One of my mentors, you have how many doors now? 178. I don't want to stay on that number, Scott, because I'm not a, I don't believe that the number of doors is right. the most important that, for me. I believe it's the quality of doors and the debt that's tied to it and, all, and the quality of the tenant and all that. Uh, Scott, what would you, can we talk about that, how the doors, 
the, the number of doors is secondary to the, the amount. So I don't do multifamily, itself. so I don't speak in numbers of doors. Multifamily people do always because they're like, well, how many doors? I but doors I do doors. houses. So all of, each one of mine is an independent house. I know a lot of multifamily people like, I have 6,000 doors, but it's three properties, right? So mm -hmm. I, um, I don't do any multifamily. All so single family. They're all single family. Okay. So right now I have 178 houses. We have 109 of them are free and clear, which is the whole basis of my business model is to be free and clear. And for anybody who's new, and I don't know how long everybody's been in the business, Everybody that teaches, trains, coaches, everybody, not everybody, because Chris is on the same page I am, is against free and clear, right? It doesn't make sense, leverage, you make more money, use the bank's money, blah, blah, blah. The reality is I'm all about free and clear. I'm all about free and clear. However, we all get to that, as soon as I mention free and clear, people turn their ears off and they're like, well, that's good for you. I can't buy houses free and clear. I don't have millions of dollars to buy houses, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's where there's a hybrid where we don't, we use leverage but we use it very short term. We do five year mortgages, we do it very short term, and we pay them off as quickly as possible. I don't, and I remember when people used to tell me this, I would think they're out of their mind, they're lying, there's nobody owns everything free and clear. And, and, and I, until I got crushed by the bust in 2007, 2008. We'll in a minute. And now I have no debt. I don't have a house mortgage, I don't have car payments, I don't have any debt, I don't have credit cards, we don't do any of that anymore, which is so anti what everybody teaches. It's literally the opposite. And That's I crazy. like it. And ever since I've done it, I can never go back. I mean, I'm all about it now. I would <laughs> never go back to having to, to manage all that anymore. I love it. Let's talk about your story a little bit, Scott. Uh, are you, you're from Hampton Roads? I'm from, I'm from Long Island originally. I've been here yeah, since 1992. So I've been here for a couple oh, yeah. minutes now. All right. Yeah. And w I, I want to hear why entrepreneurship for you? So I've always been that way, and you know, I know there's always a controversy on whether entrepreneurs are born or trained or made. I, I feel yeah. like a lot of it is born because I, I can think of even as a small child, I was selling stuff door to door, I was mowing lawns in school, I was selling candy. I was always, you know, I was always doing something. Even when I had a job, I was always doing something else to make money. That was just me, I always was. Um, when I moved to Virginia, so I sold sodas, I'll tell you a backstory. So I sold sodas on the beach in Long Island in New York. If you've ever been to Jones Beach on Long Island, it's a whole different world than what we have here. It's like walking through the Sahara, right? So it was good money I would make walking around on the beach all day. Well, then when I moved to Virginia, I thought I was gonna sell sodas here. And our beach here is a whole different animal. It's tiny and there's restaurants and hotels and vendors. And so I didn't do that anymore. So I started mowing lawns. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that was my business and I was fine with it. You know, I liked mowing lawns. I didn't have any problem with it except then my brother actually sent me a flyer on a house that was for sale and I you know and only I say only old people that are old enough to remember and we spoke about it earlier it was a non-qualifying assumption you didn't have to have any credit you didn't have to have a job you it was a non-qualifying and I always joke and I say I could not qualify as good as anyone right because I had bad credit I didn't have a job I didn't have anything it was five thousand dollars down and take over the payments and I had five thousand dollars so I bought this house to move into mm -hmm. my intention was just to live in it still landscaping, no intentions of real estate. And then probably two or three weeks after I bought it, another house on the block came up for sale and it's, mine was 5,000 down and this one said $2,000 down. Mm. And I, in hindsight, I know how ignorant that sounds, but at the time I felt like I got ripped off. I was like, oh, man, they just got me. I paid 5,000, this one's only 2,000. I didn't even know the purchase price. I didn't know anything other than mine was 5,000 down, this one was 2,000 down. <laughs> And so I had the genius idea of let me buy that one also and cost average it out, right? Mm. And then I rented it and I charged six seventy five a month. My mortgage payment was six seventy five a month, which I know Good is anybody God. have rentals here? I know how stupid that is. Um, there was no you profit, got zero cash flow, zero cash flow. But oh, in fact, you got negative cash flow because you got taxes. And well, insurance. taxes and insurance were included in my payment, okay. but I still had vacancy and repair. Yeah. But it was then every month when I would collect the payment that I started always thinking, I borrowed the money, they're paying it off. I borrowed it, they're paying it off. And that is what really struck me and be I became obsessed with non-qualifying assumptions. Every Saturday, this is before the internet, so every Saturday we were in the Saturday newspaper and I'd be circling the ones that were non-qualifying assumptions and some were as cheap as $500 down. $5,000 down was probably the most, a couple thousand dollars down and I would run out there and I bought all I could with the intention of and this again, I didn't know anything about real estate. My intention was buy a million dollars worth of property and wait out time. 
wait out, and when I, by time I mean 30 years. I was like, buy a million dollars worth of Sounds property like and I could wait 30 years and I'll be a millionaire. And that was my plan. <laughs> and it was a good plan and it would have worked. That, that, that was my plan too, Scott. <laughs> that was my plan. I said, just wait out time. Wait I said, time. just keep doing what By you're doing defaults. and wait out time. And eventually this is all going to be worth it. <laughs> Sorry, y'all. So uh, I'm thinking of myself getting those, uh, they called them no doc loans, Scott, when I got in the game. So no, the, that, that was a different thing. No doc loans where you were able to get approved with no docs. Non-qualifying assumptions means someone else qualified to get a, a, a loan, but they were letting you take it over with nothing. No job, no credit, no pulse, nothing. You just had to make a deal with the seller for the, whatever the seller wanted out of it, which was next to nothing because there was no appreciation back then. Mm. Whatever the seller wanted, as long as you came to an agreement, it was done. Okay. And so it's like a sub two. You guys all know sub two, right? It was just like a sub two, but with not the bank's home. blessing. The bank blessed it and put the mortgage in your name, not just like now we get the deed in our name with a sub two, but the mortgage stays in the seller's name. Yeah. This was the same exact thing, only the mortgage also went in your name. Cool. Okay, so you have those two properties. Fast forward, you get an epiphany. I'm going to buy these properties, wait 30 years, I'll be a millionaire by default. Yep. Fast and forward. Okay, so fast forward, I got to about 20 properties. Back then it was all Virginia Beach. Because again, I moved here in 1992, I wouldn't step outside of Virginia Beach. Even though there was deals everywhere, I was like, well, it said Norfolk, I don't know Norfolk. I, said, I, I would just do Virginia Beach. And so I got to about 20 properties, all Virginia Beach, primarily, if not all, townhouses. And then in 2001, 2001, I remember, I think it was Easter, I was driving to my mother's house and I saw a for sale sign and I was trained, as you all probably are, you pass a for sale sign, especially by owner, you call it, right? And, um, and so I called and this lady, and it was a townhouse that I knew the area, I knew the houses, they were all 65000 back then, and she told me $90,000. And I remember being like, she's out of her mind. What does she think? $90,000. <clears> and then I remember the next one I call and they're like 120, 110, because I don't know if you guys remember, 2001, 2002, 2003, it was ridiculous. Yeah. And it's then I started saying, okay, I got to look into this. Maybe 30 years, I don't have to wait 30 years, right? <laughs> so then I started attending seminars and reading books. Up until then, I didn't read real estate books. I didn't go to seminars. I just was doing my plan to wait 30 years. Then I started reading and learning real estate the way it's taught. And everybody taught and still teaches, except for us, everybody still teaches leverage. They were like, you're stupid. Basically, they didn't say this to my face, but in the book and in the seminars was saying, you're stupid if you have equity. You're, they called it dead equity. equity. They called it dead equity. Your, your money's not making you any money. You need to pull that money out and buy more houses with it. And I did. I believed it. I said, well, I'm stupid. I must pull all this money out. So I refied everything and I pulled the money out and I oh bought more God. houses. And mind you, we're in the boom now. 2002, three, four, five. By 2007, I had 84 houses. You were taking that debt and per acquired it. Yep, debt. I was using that money as down payments, getting new mortgages. Now you got debt on all everything. So now I have 84 houses and I have 84 mortgages. Wow. And I am a huge success in the world's eyes. But I'm bringing in a ton of money every month and I'm paying it out every month, right? And that was all great. I was profiting a lot, like probably like twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars a month until, and I know the numbers because I still have my sheets, right? until about mid-2007, and I always tell you, everybody says the bust was 2008, and I'm like, I assure you it was 2007 because I have my QuickBooks to prove it. It all of a sudden went upside down, not just not making my 25 grand a month, but losing 20, 25, $30,000 a month, every single month. And I had almost a million dollars in cash <laughs> saved. So I, again, I'm flipping house at the time, I'm wholesaling, I got all these houses, I'm a superhero, I'm doing great. <clears throat> And then all of a sudden I'm giving it back every single month, I'm giving it all back. Until there was no money left. And you know, and I always, I always say this, I'm like, can everybody imagine what happened when there was no money left, right? We ended up losing, out of my 84 houses, I lost about 55 of them to foreclosure. <coughs> 55 wow. of them. And that's hard on anybody. Anybody losing a house to foreclosure is hard, but it's especially hard, I'm driving around in an Escalade with stop foreclosure on the side of it. You know, that was my business. My business was foreclosures. And here I am now, I have 55 of my houses I lost to foreclosure. It was a tough, tough time. That's terrible, dog. So, getting foreclosed on, stopping. Yeah, well, other people, 
you saw all my, I want to call them colleagues, competitors, whatever you want to call them, other people in the industry, everybody blew up during the boom, right? Everybody quit their jobs and got into real estate, that. much like they did recently. New cars. Well, most of those people went back to their previous lives. They went back to, they worked at IBM or whatever they did before they decided, I'm going to quit and go do real estate. Mm -hmm. They still had that skill, they still had that job set, and they went back to their previous life. I didn't have that. I mowed lawns before I got into this, and I now had a lifestyle that was requiring like $300,000 a year, and I'm like, okay, well, if I can't do real estate, what can I do? Mm -hmm. And I thought, we believe me, I had long talks with myself on, okay, if I'm not doing real estate, what can what I, do? I do? And I came up with, I'd have to be like a surgeon, and you know, and I dropped out of high school in Which, 11th grade. I'm like, they're not gonna hire me for that. I'd have to have some kind of job like that. I'm like, they're... For the money you're talking. Yeah, to make that kind of money. I'm like, there's no job I can get that's going to sustain my life. And so we had to figure out real estate. Figure out, okay, some people were still successful. Some people were still making it work. What were they doing different? Mm. And that's when I became, I'm like, all right, let me figure out what are these people doing different than what all these other people who went back to their jobs are doing. Mm. And that's kind of where we got where we are now. Wow, that's a deep story. I just want to, can y'all real quick, just clap it up for Scott, man, please. Ah. I got some energy out of this room. Wow. So were you doing the negative, the negative cash flow thing also, Scott? Yeah, everybody taught it's okay. You're only losing a couple hundred bucks a month, but you got all this equity, and you, every year the rents will go up. And let me tell you, people still say that to this day. Rents never go down, and I'm like, I beg to differ. So not true. Rents go down, and and they can't prove it. I'm going to tell you a couple things that can't be proven. You can even Google it, and they're like, no, the data says. And rents I'm like, I don't up. care what the data says. I'm telling you what reality is. So two things they'll say: one, rents never go down. And I'm like, guess how rents go down? You have 10 properties vacant, and they sit vacant for a month. For two months, you're asking $1,000 a month. Guess what you do on month three? No try 900, nice. see what happens. Still vacant, try 800, see what happens. Until it fills. Mm -hmm. The second thing is, when they talk about the bust, and I don't want to get into a whole bust thing, but when they talk about the bust, and even the research, if you Google like how much did houses go down, they will tell you they only went down 25% or 28% or whatever the data says, and that's a crock. And I can tell you real numbers. I had real, I can give you real numbers because I actually own this house to this day. An actual house I bought at $120,000. <clears> I renovated it. I sold, I, I kept it, I refied it. I'm sorry, it came in at 199 the appraisal. They gave me an 80% mortgage, which was $150,000. So I walked away from closing with 30, almost 30,000 after closing costs. Mm -hmm. So I'm a superhero. I got no money into it and I'm leaving with 30 grand. That house got, was one of the ones that got foreclosed on. I bought that house again, and I still own it today, for $30,000. Oh. So when everybody's like, oh, they only went down 28%, I'm like, bull crap. They went down 80%. You know, it depends on what you were buying. Now, the retail sales might have went down X amount, but our deals, I bought that same house. Yeah, it appraised at 199 I bought it for 30 grand, and I still <laughs> own it today. So every, and you Google how much did houses go down during the bust, and I look at it, and I'm like, that is just not true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is, it's just what's out there, it's data, but it's, it's just not true. Okay. Mm -hmm. So fast forward, you got up. Now you have, we've passed the foreclosure part of your life. Now we're getting into where you came to the realization of your slow flip system. Did you start with that or did, was it kind of like molded over time? No, so what happened is I started <laughs> paying attention to who was still crushing it. People were still doing yeah, well during the boom, right? There There's was always somebody, right? Right, there were still people doing really well. So most of the people that were like me went out of business. Most of the people that were new that got in during the boom went back to their previous lives. And, but there were still people who were killing it. And so I started paying, what are they doing different? And, and some of them I knew, they were hard money lenders. They were older guys, they were lenders. And I, you know, I knew them, but I, you know, I wasn't friends with them. And I used to actually, I, I joke about how I used to think that they were stupid. Because I'm like, man, if they only knew what they were doing, if they only knew what they were doing, they could have so much more, right? So much well, more during money. the boom, I started, I would have lunch, I would have beers, and I would talk to them and try and find out, you know, what's going on different. And one thing, 1,000% 1, across the board, they all had in common, goes against everything everybody teaches, they all owned everything free and clear. They were untouched by the market. They owned their houses, their car, their primary, they owned everything free and clear. Mm. And, um, and it made no sense to me. I had a Cadillac XLR convertible, I had two Escalades, I had all these beautiful cars and yet I'm going to borrow money from them. They're giving me a check for 200 grand or 300 grand for hard money loans and they're pulling up in a Honda Accord. 
Mm. Never crossed my mind. I'm just thinking, man, I don't know what he, what's up with him. He's, he's the one loaning me the money and he's driving up in a Honda Accord. That's crazy. And that was just, you know, that was, it was a lot of things that didn't process with me at the time. They mm -hmm. process with me now. And I always say this to people when I speak, can anybody guess what I drive now? Honda Accord. A Honda Accord, you're damn right. And I'm, I'm committed to keeping it. Everybody always like, why don't you get a new car? I had one guy, and he's a friend of mine, but he, he buys all <laughs> kinds of fancy, crazy cars. And he's like, why don't you get a car to keep up with your image? And my answer is always, I said, I don't think you understand what my image is. <laughs> I, said, I said, I am committed to my Honda Accord. I'm keeping it. I can buy any car in the world I want. I could write a check for it. I'm keeping the Honda. Good for you. That's it. I love that. <laughs> I love that, yeah. <laughs> So you started studying people. It's funny when stuff goes rocking in our lives, we start to do a lot of introspection and look at we're not as smart as we think we are. Yeah, so we had a challenge at that time, and, and I don't know how many people have been investing a long time who remember this, but we had a challenge. The deals were the best deals you've ever seen in your life. And I can think of some, I'm thinking off the top of my head, houses prior to the the bust, we couldn't buy a house in Hampton Roads anywhere for under 100 grand. <coughs> anywhere, even the worst house was 100 grand plus. Kind of like now. After the bust, there was houses listed on MLS, some that I bought for 16 grand, 18 grand. Mm -hmm. And the best deals you've ever seen in your life, but the banks won't finance you, my money's all gone, my credit shot. And so it was like, all right, well, we have no money, we have no credit, <laughs> the banks won't finance us, but yet they're the best deals in the world or available to us right now. Oh, and that wow. was one of the catalysts toward, toward the slow flip. So it was like, okay, well, how do we take advantage of this, but I also don't want to be in debt again. And, um, but you have to be in debt in order to get them. And so that was kind of you know, how this all got born, which was we, we started borrowing money from private lenders, not banks, not hard money lenders, private individuals, but we would do them amortized on short-term mortgages. And back then, and still, we would do five-year mortgages. But they weren't five years, and this is where a lot of people get confused when they see stuff I do online. They're like, what happens in five years? You have a balloon, how are you gonna pay that off? There's no balloon. It was five years, it's amortized, and it's paid off. There's 60 <coughs> payments, there is no 61st payment. And so we started off doing that, where we were buying them on five-year mortgages, but still keeping them as conventional rentals. And it was still good, because mind you, you know, the rental business, as much as I can't stand it, it's still a good business. But I think it was in 2011, and I had my QuickBooks that I was looking at, and I think it was from July to September. I was building up my houses again, and I had about $250,000 in expense from either turnover, maintenance, repairs. For rental. And I remember freaking out, and I said, that's it, we're not doing repairs anymore. I don't know how, but we're done. I'm not doing this anymore. <laughs> And, uh, and that's where we kind of came up with the second half of the slow flip, which is we sell them with owner financing. We sell them on an agreement for deed, a land contract. Yeah. So we're buying them on short-term financing, <coughs> we sell them on long-term financing. So we don't do any of the maintenance. We don't, do any we don't do any of the tenants, toilets, and turnover, right? We don't do any of that stuff. We buy them on five-year mortgages, we sell them on 30-year mortgages. So we buy them with no money. We don't make any money, mind you, for the first five years, and then <coughs> after the the 61st payment, it's all ours. We have no mortgage left. We don't do any tenants, turnits, you know, we don't do any of that stuff. And it's strictly just profit at that point. We'll get into that in a minute. Y'all, please get your questions written down. We'll do Q and A in a minute. Please get your questions for this guy. I promise you, you won't be able to touch this guy after the day. I mean, I mean he's busy. You don't even, do you even live in America anymore? I'm serious. Y'all think yeah, I'm, I'm I like live it. in America. I don't, I no, don't know. I bought a, I we bought a house in the Bahamas. Bahamas. We bought a house in the Bahamas, and I love it there, but I still have a son who's 14, so I'm on the school schedule still for another four years. All right. And, uh, so get your questions ready. And then you, then you can ask me if I still live in America, but right now I got four more years. All right. Um, I don't want to, I want to keep going on that story, but I want uh, our audience to understand about private money, Scott. A lot of people ask me, can you refer a private money lender? Where's the website? What are they, you know, can you kind of break that down? So that's a great question. So everybody always asks, do you know a private lender? Can you refer me to a private lender? You, which private lender company do you want? And my answer go. to that is they don't exist. There, there are companies that say privatelender.com even, oh, we're private lenders. Anybody who's a business of being a private lender, to me, that is not a private lender. To me, a private lender is an individual that has money that's going to loan to you privately. And when someone asks for your private lender, I'm like, well, no. I cultivated them from my bartender talking with them and then they said, oh, I have money, I'd be interested in doing that and they're my private lender. They're just mm -hmm. mine. They're not everybody's private lender. They're not in the business of loaning private money. Mm -hmm. They are my private lender. 
That's it. And so everybody's like, well, I don't know anybody that has money or nobody in my family has money. I don't know anybody. Let me tell you something. You do. You may not know you do. You don't know. The money's out there. There's always out there. The money is out there. We have a system. You know, we can get into it if you want for raising private money. We make it so you can. You can we make it so you can never get rejected. Yeah. And uh, and it works. And every time, you know, I have a I have a private group and can never get rejected. People in the group will always be like, "Well, I didn't believe it when he first talked about it," and then they'll be like, "And I did it. I did it. And now I have enough for three deals, or I have enough for two deals, or whatever it is. It always works." And so we get, we're going to get into raising private money? I don't mind. I got nothing but time. Well, <laughs> so we'll let the audience. Is this me? Let's see what time we got. Oh, th 7.30. We got 30 more minutes. All right. So one of the, I'll tell you just a, a short version. Now we can give do short version. We, we can do three hours minutes. on it, but I'm going to give you three minutes on it. So Y'all want to hear about the private money part or go to the slow So okay. one of the keys to raising private money, how to never get rejected. <clears throat> the reason people never raise private money, the people never ask anybody for private money is because why? Fear of rejection. The same reason people don't talk to people when they're at a club, right? Because they don't, they're afraid to get rejected, so they, they leave it alone, say she went to like me anyway, right? <laughs> so fear of rejection is the reason that people don't actually raise the private money. So if we can eliminate the fear of rejection, then you, you can actually go through with it. And the way we eliminate it is we have a process so you can never be rejected. And the way we do that, it doesn't mean that you're going to get it, but it means they cannot tell you no. First off, how do you never get rejected? We never ask. We never ask anybody to loan us money. We're never out there hat in hand. We're never asking somebody, do you want to fund my deal? Instead of asking, we offer an opportunity. We offer an opportunity to make 12% return on your money secured by real estate. But, this is the caveat to this, but we don't offer it to them. And this is the, this is the key because we're offering an opportunity to make 12% on your money secured by real estate, but not for you. Do you know anybody who might be interested in making 12% return on their money secured by real estate? That's not you. I know you're all messed up doing that Bitcoin stuff or you're into all kinds of other stuff, <laughs> but not you, but you might know somebody who might be interested. And the whole key with that is you're waiting on, even though you are pitching them, you're not pitching them. You're waiting on them to say, well, why don't you tell me about it? I might be interested. No, not you. you you're, perp you're taking it away from them. And you do that on purpose because now you want to make sure you control it. If you don't control it, what's going to happen? They're going to tell you the terms. They're going to tell you the rate. They're going to tell you everything. You want to make sure you're telling them the terms. We do five years at 12% um, backed by real estate. And the only way you're doing that is by controlling the conversation where we are offering an opportunity, but not to you. Until they say, well, tell me about it. I might be interested. Well, okay, I'll tell you about it. This is what we do, and this is the way it works. It's our program. We're not asking, do you want to loan me money? If I ask you, if you ask anybody, do you want to loan me money? Guess what the first answer is? No. They don't even have to hear the details. It doesn't matter how great of a deal it is. If you're trying to borrow money, they're already thinking no, or if they know they're being pitched, they're already putting up their walls on how can I get out of here? How can I get out of here? How can I tell them? My phone's ringing. Sorry, my wife's calling. She's in the car. I gotta go. They're already planning their exit, so it's not going to work. And, and you're not even going to pitch it because you know they're planning their exit, so you're going to feel like, I'm not even going to bother because they're going to reject me and I'm not even going to see them next week, so I'm not even going to ask. Okay. When you do it this way, you're empowered because now we are not asking. We're offering an opportunity, and it is a true opportunity. Believe me, I've had the same lenders since 2011. I get emails from them telling me how much I saved their retirement, how I made it possible for them to retire. We've not, we, when I talk about our business is a win-win-win, it's not just on my buyers, it's not on my sellers, it's not on the slow flips, it's also on the lenders. We have changed our lenders' lives by making them a 12% return on their money. They have a secure retirement because of what we do. And so it's important that you accept that you are giving them an opportunity of a lifetime, giving them a 12% secured return on their, on their money, but not for them for somebody that they may know. And sometimes it is somebody. Sometimes they will say, you know, hey, you know, I know a guy who's looking to invest in something. But more often than not, they'll be like, well, why don't you tell me about it? Why don't you tell me about it? And they can't tell you no. Even if you tell them about it, you're not pitching them. You're just telling them about what you're offering. Mm -hmm. So the worst they can say is, that's really interesting. I'll let you know if I do know somebody interested. So it can't end with, get no. out of here. My wife's calling me. I got to run. Because you're not asking. Okay, so after the day, we don't ask individuals for money. Never we? ask. We offer <laughs> an opportunity. That's it. If you ask, yeah, that. automatically they're going to say no. Even, it's just an instinct. They're going to say no before they even know what you're asking. <laughs> we'll get the cue in. So that is a great question. So I he just asked me. It for the so he just asked, how did I stumble upon that? And that is a great question. And I'm going to tell you how I stumbled upon it. It was not intentional. My very first lender, um, you guys may know her. She owns the Town Center City Club. Her name is Barbara Lewis. She was my very first lender. And I've been a member there since they first opened. Well, I went in there to talk, that's a, that's a club that has a lot of members and she knows a lot of people. So I went in and actually talked to her about 
finding me lenders, helping me to find lenders, with no intention of her being my lender. Until she came back and she's like, well, so how are you paying that? And it's secured. And she asked me all the questions. And I was not pitching her. I was asking her so she can set she me up. Anybody. And then she was my very first lender. She, and she, because she was like, well, tell me, that's how, I'll do that. And I was like, huh. And then it, it, it took a while to click with. I was like, how did I even get her as a lender? And I was like, because I was telling her about the process if she knew somebody. Yes. And so then I became intentional about it. I realized how it worked. Why had I got her as my lender is because I was asking her if she knew somebody, and so I started doing it with intention. Uh, I, I want to get off of private money, but I just want to at least ask, at least ask Scott. Uh, I hear a lot of people say, well, I don't know anybody to even ask. Well, my family didn't have any money. My friends, they don't even want to ask the person. Right. Well, that's the great part about it. When you're not asking them, they can't tell you no. So just assume nobody has any so money. The mindset is right. No, you you, ain't got you no just money. assume you don't have any money, but you, maybe do you know somebody right, who might yeah. be interested in, in making a 12% return on their money? When you go at it with that mindset, it changes everything because the, it's the <clears throat> fear of rejection or the fear. Oh, I don't yeah. know anybody with money. Everybody right. tells me that. Well, nobody I know, my friends, my family, nobody has everybody any money. Because I always say, start with friends and family. Even though you know they don't have any money, it doesn't matter. We they they know somebody who does. There's everybody's got a private lender in their circle. Everybody does. It may not be the people you know specifically, but somebody that they know does. That's true. And so that's why you have to let everybody know that you're seeking to give them a return. How many of these private money people do you think someone would need? A hundred of them? Or yeah, so that is a great question. So his question was, how many private lenders do you need? And I come up with this all the time with people in my group. You need one. You need one private lender. And the reason is, you're like, well, my lender only has 60 grand, so what's that going to do for me? You get a couple deals? The reason is, as long as you're committed to making sure your lenders are paid perfectly every time, every month, on time, every time, all of your lenders, all of my lenders stem from my original lenders, all of them. So the calls, this is where it changes over time. The calls I get from my lender, people know people who are like themselves, right? So what happens? Your lender has 300 grand, 60 grand, whatever it is. Guess what his friends have? The same thing. They're in the same situation. When he's at a cocktail party or he's hanging out with his friends and he's networking and they're talking about what happened in whatever investments they're in, what's he talking about? Man, I'm getting 12% on my money secured. Every month on the first I get a check. And, uh, and guess what question they're asking? You think he needs another one? You think he needs another one? So when they text you or call you, your lender, they're saying, hey, do you by any chance need another lender? A friend of mine wants to get into this. So you're always in the position of power. You're always in that authority position because they're asking, do you need another lender? You're not asking them, they're asking you. They're asking I have a friend who wants to do the same thing. Are you willing to meet with them? He's, you know, they want to make that return. I, have, I got Virginia Beach judges are my lenders. I got, I got all kinds of people and they all stemmed from my original lenders. Referrals. Yeah. Got it. Okay, so you're setting up this thing. You got private people paying you, uh, I'm sorry, you're borrowing, borrowing money from private people. You're buying real estate. Now, how, do we, how does that go into the slow flip system? So we buy properties, you low-end properties. And I know a lot of people have been taught to hate low-end properties, but I'm going to tell you why I love low-end properties. They are the best possible return you can make. And let me tell you why people hate them. They are the worst possible properties you can own. They are the worst properties for rentals, highest turnover, highest maintenance, biggest pain in the ass people, everything about them you don't want to deal with. So why would anyone want a low end property? But that's why we get such great deals. As a landlord, I would never buy them. They're the worst. As a, a rehabber, I would never buy them because now, oh, you're going to get ripped off and you have your stuff being worked on and you're having issues going on while you're doing it, even though even the worst neighborhoods now are flipping well. but. For years they weren't, you know, and it was challenging, so they would sit there. So I agree, as a landlord, I wouldn't want low-end properties. They're the worst. They're, you know, people are like, yeah, but it only brings in X amount a month, and you have higher maintenance, higher turnover, worse tenants, all these headaches to deal with. But as a slow flip, we're just the bank. That's it. We are offering financing to our buyer. We offer financing, no credit check, X amount of money down, X amount of money a month. We offer an opportunity that our buyers cannot get anywhere else. And so we don't have the turnover, we don't have the repairs, we don't have the headaches that everyone else has. And let me tell you why low end, which was really your question. If, and I'm going to make up numbers. If you, if you were to buy a Virginia Beach townhouse, uh, and I'm going to make up numbers here, but let's say a, a Virginia Beach townhouse that's $200,000, and how much are you going to get in rent? Right now, today, you might get $1,600 a month in rent, because rents have gone way up. But if you were to buy four $50,000 houses, People say, oh, $50,000 houses don't exist. Yes, they do. We buy them all the time. 
You buy four $50,000 houses, you're gonna get about $1,200 a month on each of them. Each That's $4,800 a month compared to your $1,600 a month. That's why I love low-end properties. Mm. You get a significantly higher return than you get with the higher-end properties. And I said higher-end being 200,000. That doesn't compare to the three, four, 500,000 where the returns just diminish. Yeah, almost zero. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you're getting a lot of value out of this. But check it out. I've got my friend Scott right here in the studio with me right now. He wants to give you a free bonus. Scott, tell him what you got, buddy. Chris, we have put together a packet with everything somebody needs to absolutely get started. So first off, it's got my book in it, The Art of the Slow Flip. And that is a step-by-step -step on how to do absolutely every spot, every segment of slow flipping from finding them to funding them to filling them to how to do the paperwork. I mean, I included, there's nothing left out of it. But then we also put in a ton of bonuses, as you can see right there. We have a private community. We have the blueprint, how some of our students have gotten 60, 70, $90,000 a month in slow flip income so far. We did a private money training on how we're raising private money to do these deals setting up your future vision, case studies. I got students that have only been with me for six months now. I just had a meeting earlier today. One of the girls has 18 already in just six Holy months. Cow. It's incredible on how they are doing. And so we, we compiled all of this data, all of these resources, and we're putting it all together for you guys right now. And so I'm really, you know, we talking earlier, Chris, about your mission, and I'm on a mission. I'm on a mission too. It's a slightly different one than yours, but I'm on a mission to help as many people as possible to set themselves free through real estate investing. And this is going to set them on that path to get them there. Thanks, Scott, so much. So look, the link to get, order all this stuff is right in the video description. Uh, it's uh, Plus to book all these bonuses. Don't wait. Click on it right now, and they can come back and finish watching the video. Thank you so much for your support. Thanks, Scott. This is going to change their lives, Chris. Thanks for having me. Yes, yeah, so okay, bye. Well, Scott, what about the mindset of being a bank? I know a, uh, a lot of people kind of need to switch from being a landlord. It took me a, quite a long time. Yeah, so I'm going to tell you something that people laugh at when I say, but so the whole normal industry, right? The Burr method. Everybody heard of the Burr method, right? Oh, the buy, rehab, refinance, rent, repeat, right? Everybody loves that. The conventional landlords method. I have this theory in my head, and it's a joke, but I really kind of believe it, that it was all predicated and started by the banks. I'm like, I bet you they hired a guy to go out here, put on a suit and go teach people to go buy properties on this method. Why? So that they'll do all the work, they'll do the repairs, they'll go to court, they'll that fix the air conditioning so unit, they'll do all the work, and then when they're done, they'll collect money and they send it on up to us. The whole model is based on doing all the work, getting the money, and sending it to the bank. That's it. With our model, we're the bank. It's the exact opposite. Everyone else is doing the work. They're running around. They're doing the repairs. They're doing because we sell to a lot of investors. They're doing the repairs. They're doing the Section Eight. They're fixing the air conditioning unit. They're going to court, and then they're collecting the money and they're mailing it to us mm -hmm. instead of what I did for years, which was I'm mailing it to the bank. Mm -hmm. But uh, I look at your journey, Scott. You transform into that from your experiences. Yeah. How? Can you, what can you just talk about the average landlord? I mean, they didn't go through the same problems you did. How can we explain to them like, hey, this might be something you want to try? So it's interesting when you ask that. So when I talk to people and I talk to a lot of people, somebody who's been in business, either not at all or started in real estate after 2009, 10, 11, has only seen the market go up. And so nothing I say resonates with him. And I don't blame him for that because it wouldn't have resonated with me. If you talked to me in 2005, I would have been like, he's out of his mind. He can make so much more money if, right? And so I don't blame them for that. It's, it's either A, people that are older that have been through it and, and know what can and did and will happen, or people that haven't started yet and aren't fixated. And this is where my model comes in. If you're looking for Lamborghinis and yachts, this is not for you. And I tell people that. I said, listen, my, my system is for people that just want freedom. People that want to be able to make their five, 10, 20, $30,000 a month that they need to be free, this can get you there. If you're looking to get millions of dollars so you can go buy yachts and Lamborghinis and, and throw money up in the club, this is not the system for you. And I don't know that there is a system that's for you, but, it, but this is not it. This is, this is for a consistent monthly money and to set you free. It's not for making millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. So is that your approach to the, let's just say the average or typical landlord that has because when I see people coming to me, they're like, I'm not getting rent. You know, um, I, I, have to, I have these repairs that somebody lived in my property. Now I got to spend 3000 fixing it up. And I'm just thinking to myself, 
why are they still doing this? And they I are just, trapped. They're trapped. Conventional landlords <coughs> are trapped. Mm. They're, they're in a prison. They were sold a bill of goods. They were sold on the Burr like method. We were. Like we were. Exactly like I was. They're, they're trapped. And I know people that mm. come on to my stuff now and they convert their existing rentals to slow flips mm -hmm. because there's two sides of the slow flip, the buy side and the sell side. Even if you bought it conventionally, you can still do the sell side. Yes. You still can eliminate your monthly repairs, your monthly expenses. You can still eliminate your calls, your turnover. Yeah. You can still eliminate all that even if you have a mortgage yes. and can't pay it off in five years. Yes. We'll get the Q. Okay, Joe. Let's do Q&A at the end. At 8 o'clock, we'll do Q&A if you don't mind. Just for the, for the recording. <clears throat> Lessons, Chapo, you, you know, you got car blown. You can. Uh, I was trying to get it for Urshan. All right. Uh, Y'all get your questions down at 8 o'clock, we'll do Q&A if you don't mind. Go ahead, Scott. I don't know. What was I saying? I don't know where that shit. Uh, you're talking I saw about a question. I was going to get own, it. <laughs> you still have a mortgage, but you can still do the slow yeah, flip. Yeah, so there's two sides to the slow flip, the buy side <clears> and the sell side. Now, I prefer always to do my buy side where they're paid off in five years. However, I still buy sub twos. I, you know, my most expensive one now is 875000 so I still buy higher-end houses if they work and the numbers work, and I'll still buy it and then sell it with the owner financing. Mm -hmm. So I don't mind that at all. I have some that are wildly profitable, but I have a mortgage on it. I didn't qualify. I didn't get the mortgage. I bought it sub two, which is, if you don't know, it's just like a non-qualifying assumption, except without the bank's blessing. Yeah. And, um, and, and then you still sell it as a slow flip. So I still have all the benefits of the sales side, just not the buy side. I'm not free and clear in a couple of years, but I still get the cash flow. So you still do, because a lot of us might have uh, mortgages on their property still right. today. So we can still do this system with a mortgage. I want to make sure we're clear. Correct. Absolutely. Uh -huh. Okay. So what, can you just talk about the traditional landlord? What can you give them to kind of get them out of being the landlord? So uh, if I was a traditional landlord, and I was, and I had properties right now that have tenants in them, and I wanted to convert them, we send them letters. We send our existing tenants letters. They're our number one source. We send them a letter <laughs> stating that, you know, we've decided we're not going to renew your lease. We're going to sell the property. Um, with owner financing, however, since you're already in the property, we are offering it to you with no money down, so we don't ask them for a down payment because they're already in it. Your payment will only change to X, and I change it moderately just so it makes it look like a mortgage and not a uh, rent payment, mm -hmm. and we leave everything else the same. What we really did was we gave ourselves a three, $400 a month raise because now we're not doing any no turnover, repairs. we're not doing any repairs, oh. and now they get the pride of ownership. They're the ones taking so. care of it. We get to do what I call super retail, so it might be worth 200 We might be able to sell it at 225 and the reason I call it super retail is because not only are we exceeding the market because there is no appraisal, there is no mortgage, but also there's no commission. On a typical rehab sale, we might spend 10% with closing cost assistance and yep. agent commissions. Mm -hmm. There's none of that. So on a $200,000 property, that's an extra 20 grand. Plus wow. we, we do what I call super retail because we can bump the market, go for the highest. And, it doesn't, and also there's no punch list. There is no rehab before we sell it. If you were to sell conventionally, you have to bring it up to the top of the market. You have to do a punch list beforehand, could cost you thousands of dollars. We don't have any of that. They're already in it. We just get the top of the market price and finance it to the existing tenant. What, Scott, what is the biggest hesitancy that you see from people that don't want to get into this? Because you make it the way you say it. It's like, right. why would I do anything about this? There are reasons that people don't like it. So I'm going to get into a couple of them. So slow flips are not for everybody, right? Some people hate them. And I even told, I think I told you this. I said, some people will be there and say, this sucks. I hate it. I want nothing to do with slow flips. One of the reasons people hate it is fear of what if they buy. So I have a good friend of mine and he literally said to me, when I, he, he has regular rentals and he has all the headaches in the world and I try to talk him into doing slow flips. And he said to me, his exact words were, with my luck, they'll all end up buying them. And I'm like, do you hear what you're saying? With your luck, they'll end up buying it. It means you got to sell them at super retail with no commissions, no repairs, no renovations. <laughs> yes, if they buy them, you take that money and buy three more, right? With each one. However, in his head, he loved his houses and he's like, well, I don't want to lose them. These are my properties. I don't want to lose them. Other people, conventional landlords, they love their houses. They painted the door bright red. They got a custom um, night light out, you know, a, a lamp. And they love everything about the house. They drive by it with pride. And they're like, hey, look, that's my house. You see what I did over there? That's a new roof. And so they don't want to take it. They don't want someone else to own it. That's their baby. Mm -hmm. And so they will hate the idea of slow flips. When you do slow flips, it is no longer your baby. It is someone else's baby. Someone else has the pride of ownership. Someone else is the one picking out the paint color and doing the landscaping or whatever they want to do. You have no say in it, no different than Bank of America has no say in your house. Mm. That's it. You're out. 
they are just pieces of paper to me and people have a hard time with that because they love their houses and I'm like I don't know my houses my houses are just numbers they're pieces of paper that's it they're not houses anymore and and, that, and so that's a reason people hate it they're like no but I, I love my houses I'm like well then don't do slow flips because <laughs> they're not yours anymore that's interesting. How about the depreciation and the right uh, right off? We still we still depreciate like them just the same. There's a lot of controversy on that. And again, okay. I've been audited three times, and so I I always tell people when they have tax strategies, I always say, well, that's great. Have you been audited? And they're like, no. I say, well, then it means nothing. Nobody looks at your taxes until you get audited. Yeah. Nobody even looks at them. Everybody's like, oh, I've been de I've been deducting my cat as an employee for 27 years. I'm like, well, that's great. Have you been audited? <laughs> no. Well, then it means nothing. <laughs> when you get audited, we decide if it means anything, right? Until you get audited, they nobody and people don't. Understand understand this nobody looks at your return until you get audited so whenever somebody tells me they're doing some tax strategy the first thing I ask them is have you been audited and they're like no I say, well then you can keep it it means nothing to me <laughs> nothing at all okay so I and I can't say that this I'll tell you exactly what the auditor told me so I've been audited three times and the auditor he he books me as rent so I got everything booked as rent I still depreciate I still treat it like rent but, and this is the caveat to what he said, there's eight, Hampton Roads, we have two and a half million population. There's eight, at least at this time, this was years ago, six, seven years ago, there was eight auditors for all of Hampton Roads. So two and a half million people, there's eight auditors. Well, he told me, he told me he, exactly that. He said, Scott, there's eight auditors in Hampton Roads. If all eight of us audited you, we would have eight different answers. Mm. He said, and these were his words, he said, there is more tax code than any one of us can read in our entire lifetimes, so it's our job to, our job to interpret it to the best of our ability. Which is ridiculous, in my opinion, that any code can be that way, but that is the way he told it to me. Basically, what he was saying is, this is what I think, but if you get audited next week, they may give you a completely different answer. <laughs> That's crazy. So you can still appreciate, okay, um, I, I had no idea. I'm, I'm still learning here too. So we got a few more minutes, Scott, so we got, you're into the, pro uh, into the properties. Tell me about these people that want to live in the tight thirty thousand dollar house. So who is our buyer? I'm going to go with who is our buyer and yeah, not who, necessarily who the people are. So we sell to multiple different people. Believe it or not, we sell to a lot of investors, and I refer to this investor as 2005 Scott, me. So 2005 Scott would have bought anything he could with little money down, no credit check. Finance. I can make a spread for two, three hundred dollars a month. Well, most investors still do that. They're still taught that. Most seminars, most books train them to do that. So they, they train them to look for my ad, which says, no credit check, $3,000 down, 875 a month. So the, we sell to a lot of investors. We also sell to a lot of Section 8 investors. There is no shortage right now, it's a boom right now, of Section 8 seminars, coaching, training, courses. And they teach them, and I, I'm, I, I go to a lot of them and I watch their videos, and they train them to look for me. They train them to find someone like me who's willing to sell for X amount of money down, X amount of month, and oh, yeah. they fix them up, and then they might get $1,400 a month, and they're only paying me $875. So it works for them. They, they win. That's why I always say it's win, win, win. Everybody wins. My lender's winning. My seller wins. I win. My buyer wins. Everybody wins in the transaction. So yes, my buyers make money. I don't care. I want them to make money. I want everybody to make money. All I am is the bank. And then there's homeowners. There, now there's homeowners who buy them. And homeowners buy them because they can. Everybody's like, well, why would a homeowner buy this for 89000 when there's one like it for fifty? And, and homeowners have even asked me. They're like, well, I saw another one on the block for this price. Um, and my answer to them is, well, I would buy that one. That sounds like a really good deal. And then they'll say, well, that one I have to pay cash for. And I'm like, well, then I would buy mine. And I leave it at that. I'm brutally honest with everybody. And I tell them exactly, hey, this is the way it is. Mine, you only have to pay X Fine. amount down and X amount a month. The other one seems like a much better deal, but you got to pay 50 grand cash. If you have 50 grand cash, that's a better deal for you. So that's financing is the answer. So the, the real key is we sell the financing, the house comes with it. That's our value. That the, the value we're adding is the financing. The house comes with it. The real value that we're selling is in fact the financing. I'm taking notes. The house comes with it. I'll never forget, I heard Robert Kiyosaki say, Financing, financing, financing. I didn't understand it, Scott, until I got it deeper into the business of financing that is not, I used to think, Scott, that the only financing out there was going to the bank, filling out the application, and getting on my knees, begging that they would qualify me. I haven't used a bank since the bus, since 2007. I have not used a bank for anything. I mean, not for cars, funny. not for housing, not for anything. I haven't used a bank since 2007. It's so weird how your life's so different when you go through that thing, right? 
So, yeah, so I'm going to talk about it back. I'm going to cut you off for one second. Mm -hmm. I read this in a book. This isn't me making it up, but I really loved it. And he, and he talked about in this book, he said, if you were to go in a bank and apply for a mortgage, apply for a car payment, whatever, and the banker comes out and he's like, good news, and puts a stamper on it that says approved, how would you feel if instead that stamper said enslaved? Enslaved. Because that's what it is. They trapped you now. They trapped you, and you now owe for 30 years or 60 months or whatever the, whatever the term is, you, you've been enslaved now by that debt. And so I always remember that after I read that in that book. Life I'm like, and air. Yep, yeah, exactly. I said, that, I said that's what it is, that enslaved. Book. Life and air. You come out and you look at the stamp and it says enslaved. That changed my whole perspective. I thought getting into debt was what you're supposed to do. That's Did anybody else think that? Am I the only one? Yes, I guess so. Good good they all debt. do. Good debt. You know, it is good debt and bad debt. But I'm just talking about forever. I mean, just think, you know, just build your whole empire on debt. But as Scott says, it can crumble quickly. And mine did too in 2010. I lost. Now, the, the caveat to that, the difference would be if I'm doing apartment complexes, if I'm doing shopping centers, if I'm doing something on a massive scale, and I'm not doing any of that. But if I was, then obviously I'm going to agree that we have to do the leverage model. But for the houses, even what they consider good debt, and they're like, no, no, it's a good debt. It brings in 2000 a month, and your payment's only 1500 a month. Vacancies. I said, well, what about when it's vacant? i got to pay that 1500 a month. Repairs. What about when it's, when it's occupied, and they're not paying, and they're suing me? I have to pay, and now it's six months. till I said, I have to pay that money. And I'm not, you know, that's, that's where I'm like, no, it sounds good on paper, but the reality is life happens. Life happens. And... Next thing I know, I'm, I'm paying all that money that so, they told me was good. Uh, I want to get to, you got some goodies for us tonight. We'll give them a website in a minute, but how do you advertise for these things, Scott? Is it slow flip? You put a sign out, I got a slow flip? Selling them? Yeah. Selling them is a piece of cake. So there is so much demand for what we do that it is insane. Like people are always like, well, who, how are you going to find somebody or who's going to want that? Because we don't renovate them. We sell them exactly as is, right? And so people are always like, well, who would do that? Who would buy it? The garbage is still on the floor. And, and who would do that? The demand is insane. So we sell them with a couple different ways. One is we run ads in Facebook Marketplace, which is the, right now in That's today's crazy. market, it's the number one way. We run ads on Craigslist. And we put out signs in front, just like I bought my very second house. Remember I told you it said $2,000 down, no credit check, and that's what got me into real estate? Um, that's exactly the same signs we do now. I, I basically sell the exact same way I started buying, which was no credit check, low money down, and, uh, and I sell the exact same way. So between those three ways, and mind you, we'll get 100 leads and we only have one house. So the second oh time, the next house, we, before we ever run an ad or put out a sign, we already have 99 people that didn't get the first house. So we'll start with them. And we have a software system that just sends one text and it goes to everybody who ever called on any house and say, hey, we got a new property and gives them all the information. It. And it just makes it super easy. Houses, cool. like I have zero vacancies right now. And when I do get one, it's generally hours, like two hours, three hours till it's filled. Unbelievable. How would you guys like to have your vacancies filled in one day? That's just crazy. All right, that's all I got for you, Scott. Uh, if you guys please get some Q&A. Anything you want to leave with us, Scott, for, for before we get to Q&A? No, but I know she had the first question way back then. Wait, I got a mic here. We got to get your mic. All right. Go ahead, <laughs> um, if you got a question, no, nah, just raise your hand. We'll, we'll repeat it up here. So, I'll just repeat uh, it into the mic. I don't know if you're aware, but the, um, the uh, I guess, the forecast that Zillow put out saying that all the people who bought houses under the current conditions, it's going to take uh, 13 and a half years for them to break even. So as a person who wants to buy a house, when do you know when it's safe to buy a house? And because you don't, I don't want to be one of those people that's having to wait 13 and a half years to break even or have a profit, seat any type of profit in the house I bought in the last couple of years with these. For equity, you mean? You're talking about the equity build, build up, back up? Uh, the value of the home. So I, I got two answers on that. So the question was, when do I know it's a good time to buy a house? Zillow is now saying it's going to be 13 and a half years to break even based on the current market condition. So I have two different things to say on that is one, um, as investors, we never buy retail. So we have that that equity buildup. So VA will allow you to still buy at a deal. You're allowed to VA even has a um, even has a, a renovation loan. They do have one. I've sold to people that used a renovation loan through VA. So you don't have to buy it um, retail. retail. But even at that, you can buy a perfect house still below market through marketing, through 
through um, your own advertising, through your door knocking, through pre foreclosures, or whatever your marketing so may be, with direct with seller. You don't have to buy off the MLS to use your VA. You can, now, VA, if you're using a conventional VA, they are going to check and make sure they obviously do a VA um, appraisal, which is an inspection also. But, it, but there are good, ha we buy good houses that it might be a distressed seller. You, we, I always, when I go on appointments, I tell people we add value in one of two ways. We're either a distressed seller or a distressed property. So they can be a distressed seller, but the property's not distressed. And we can still add value by buying that, a distressed seller, not a distressed property. The second thing I wanted to bring up on that is the market. If you would have talked to me this time last year, I would have told you with confidence, and I was confident, that 2023, it was gonna bust. Every, all the data showed that it was going to, every talking head you listened to, everything it, it was supposed to. And we only kept going up. And so I've come to the conclusion this year, and I've changed my tune, that I, everybody's asked me, what do you think about the market? What do you think's gonna happen? What do you, blah, blah, blah. You know what I tell everybody? I say, we are all gonna find out the same day, and that's gonna be a day <laughs> after it happens. A day after it happens, we're all gonna find out the same day because there is no data that's gonna show what's gonna happen because of government interference too. They keep changing stuff and so we're all gonna find out at the same time. And then half the people are gonna say, that's what I knew was gonna happen. And half the people are gonna say, I didn't see that coming. And I've just decided, you know what? The day when it happens, we're all gonna find out at the same time. That is a mess. You know, I guess people would look to you as kind of the oracle since you've been doing it for so long. My answer is, nah. So he, Scott doesn't know, I'm telling you. Nobody I know. knows. I realized that last year because let me tell you, last year, everybody, and I paid, I read so much and I watched so many videos on people talking about the market and it was, according to the data, 2023 was gonna be in the yeah. toilet and it just kept going up. Well, it's just starting to soften now. now. It was softening this time last year too though. Big time. But I mean, it's, obviously we're more soft this year than we were last year, but it's, it was softening this time last year too. October, November, December last year was definitely a slowdown, but we just kept right on trucking along. Prices are still going up. I'm like, all right, we're all going to find out after it happens. At the same time, we'll have another meeting here. We'll be like, ah, guess what? It was last month. It happened. <laughs> Joppo, go ahead, brother. It's like rent to own. So his question was, is a slow flip rent to own? It's like rent to own. I used to do lease options, which technically a lease option is a rent to own. And I switched it to an agreement for deed or a land contract. They're called different things in different states. Um, different, different paperwork. It's the same end result. The difference is, and, and I don't like when people do agreement for deeds even or, land, or lease options where they give them a year or two years because I feel like you're setting them up to fail. You know, generally, if someone can't qualify now, they can't qualify in two years, right? And so what I've changed is I give them the full term. We're giving them the full 30 years. And, and I tell them that. I say, you never have to refi. You never have to improve your credit. You never have to have a better job. What you have to do is make your payment every month. That's it. As long as you do that, you'll never hear from me again. And, and so it's very similar, but a little bit different in the sense that I give them full term. They don't have to qualify with us. Yeah, they don't have to qualify. But I'm going to tell you something that's in your head right now, and I can hear it with your words. You're, in your head, you're thinking, I will lose the home. When in my head, when in my head, when someone pays it off, I won. You're looking at it as a loss. I'm looking at it as a win. But no, but guess what you do with that money when they pay you off? You buy two more. You're not, we're not losing houses. Now we got cash and we're investors, so we buy at a discount. So now we use that money and we buy two or three more with that same amount of money. Because that's what we do. That's not what they do. What they do is look for people like us who give them the financing. What we do is find deals. So when, when we get that cash, we use that money and buy two or three more. My son is 14, but he's already got 30 houses. He, um, he, that's what he's going to do. I mean, I, he may do something else. I'm sure he will, but he's going to do real estate too because there's nothing else like that's it, you know, when, when, and, and I had, he said, that's what we do. And I want to touch on that for a second. So I had a lender who, uh, he, he's passed away now. He was, he was probably 93 when he said this to me and he was still building houses and he was still buying rentals. And I'm like, you know how long it takes to even break even on a rental. And we were in a limo going up to Dover to gamble. And I, and he was doing deals in the car. And I remember, and I said to him, I said, I said, doc, when's enough enough? How, you know, 
how much are you going to do? And he said exactly that. He said, he said, we never stop. This is, this is what we do. This is who we are. And I remember when he said that because it really was intriguing to me because I, I always thought that he was a number. When we get to this much, we stop. Or when we have enough coming in, then we just are done, right? And he's in his 90s and had more money than anybody I knew. But he's like, well, he's still building houses, still buying rentals. And he's like, that's who I am. This is what we do. And it wasn't about making more money. He didn't need more money. It was just, this is, this is who I am. And I, and I like that because it's hard to embrace that. It's not, we're not working to get to X dollar amount. This is what we do. So I wouldn't. I, so his, his question was, I have significant equity in my properties. Would I pull the equity out? So me personally, I like my properties free and clear, so I wouldn't pull it out. I would sell it, say, and I'm just going to make up numbers for you. Say you owe 100 and they're worth 300 now. I would probably be selling at 340 and I would get X amount positive per month. My goal would be to pay it off as quick as possible so it's all mine every single month. And I do nothing now, but on the first of the month I get my check. Because again, if you pulled out the equity, now you have an obligation. What you cash this is a saying people argue with me on, but I always say, I said, money, you can't spend money, you can only spend the money your money makes, right? So if you pulled out the money, now you have an obligation to reinvest that money to buy something else. You can't spend it. So if you can't spend it anyway, it's already invested in a house, you might as well leave it invested in that house and spend that money the money makes. It's the same difference. So it, my, me personally, when the money's already invested, I want my house is free and clear. So then and that money coming every month, I could spend if I wanted to. You can only spend the money your money makes. So this is, Y'all get that? This is, this is way off topic, but this is the reason why lottery winners go broke, people that inherit millions of dollars go broke, people that do lawsuits and get millions of dollars go broke, is because they spend the money that they got. If they would just spend 10 minutes and realize it didn't matter if you got a million, five million, 20 million, whatever it is, you must, you're obligated to invest that money. And now the money it makes every year, you can spend like a drunken sailor because next year it's coming again. And next year it's coming again. But if you spend the actual money, it's gone. Mm -hmm. It's over and you're back to whatever you were doing before you want it. And it happens, and it's a statistic, the average lottery winner is back to their same base um, income or base uh, net worth three to five years from the time they won it. And these are people that won $20 million, $30 million. Three to five years, they're back to whatever they were doing prior. Mm -hmm. It's insane. And I'm like, if you can just not spend a dollar, invest it, and then you can spend it like a drunken sailor for the rest of your life. But you have to invest it first. But Scott, that's a habit and a skill set that one has to learn. Uh, believe me, me too. I'm, we all learn the hard way. <laughs> we all learn the hard way. <laughs> I'm going to come to you. Jody, Joppa was, is one of the guys that I've been trying to get him to do slow flip slash rent to own, Scott. Could you give him something? Well, so my question to you I would be... He loves his houses. Exactly. And, and he, well, I can tell by his words because he said he, he, he would lose his house. He would lose, lose his house instead of, instead of gain, you know, massive money. Not your equity because your equity would be one thing. If you just got your equity, it would be no different than if you sold. But you're not just getting your equity, you're getting super cash equity flow. because you're getting, you're getting, if they were to pay you off though, it's not cash flow. If they were to pay you off, you're getting what would have been your equity plus well, the extra 10% because you didn't pay any commission, you didn't pay any closing costs, you didn't have to renovate it for the sale, you didn't have to do punch list. So you got, you got super retail. And so now you would take that money and buy, buy two more just like it. That's most people's biggest fear is they're like, well, I don't want to lose my houses. And I'm like, we're looking at it differently because I see it as a win. And when you said lose, I know exactly how you're, you're seeing it as wow. I love my house. I've had it for how many years have you had it? 10, 15 years now, right? Yeah. So to you, it's a part of you. Those houses are a part of you. And, um, and you don't want to lose it. No, not for me. Yeah. And, and it may not be for you. If you really want your houses forever, then slow flips might not be for you. Because you may think, no, this is, these 20 houses are going to be mine forever. In which case, you don't have that guarantee with slow flips. Now, with slow flips, we have the guarantee of this income will be ours forever, but we don't know which 20 houses it'll be. Because it may transition to other houses. Cool. You got that job on. Next question. Listen, while you are here, pull out your pen. Scott, you got a free book. I'm going to get to you. The, the, you're going to give my audience tonight. Correct. So I wrote a book that goes through detailed everything step by step. It's called The Art of the Slow Flip. And I made a, um, I made a link for Chris for you guys can get it for free. You have, you have the link. So uh, go ahead and go to slowflip.com forward slash Haskins event. Haskins event. And for everybody on YouTube, that'll be in the video description. Just click right on it. It'll take you right to there. Slowflip.com forward slash Haskins event. You're going to get the Slow Flip book for free. Correct. And I'm telling y'all, this is, this, is how I run my biz- uh, this is how I run my business. Next, my friend. Uh, no, I thought that was, you answered the question. My first, I had two questions. So you answered the 
first one with that last thing, but uh, what, what percentage are defaulting? So his question, this is a great question, what percentage is defaulting? I don't know a specific number and I should learn it, but it's minimal and it's far less than actual tenants. And the reason it's far less is because providing you get good ones, and sometimes we get bad ones who are just trying to skirt a credit check. The reason is, is because for one, they have money down, so that's not just first and last month, they're generally putting three grand, five grand, some houses out in Virginia Beach, we might be putting 15 grand down, or even higher. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, they've been responsible for it, so they're renovating it, they're making it their home. The real value to them, which they don't really grasp in year one, or not all of them do, is their payment never goes up. So, where, and I try and tell them this when we do our paperwork, I'm like, listen, next year, say they're paying 1200 a month. Next year, all of your friends who are paying 1200 a month are gonna get a nice letter from their landlord saying now the rent's 1275, yours is still gonna be 1200. 10 years from now, when they're going up and they're 1800, yours is still 1200. And, and I make sure to drive that home with them so they appreciate the opportunity that they're getting. Their payment is fixed. We operate just like a bank. No, I think it's awesome. So you're going through a, a you're basically reassuming if they were to default, we start right over again. And sometimes it's a windfall. So sometimes I might have sold a property at $89,000 and like these last three years, our market was insane. That same property, I get back 225,000 because the market went crazy. And instead I was getting 875 a month, now I might be getting 1475 a month just because the market was insane these last couple of years. That's exactly where I was going, Bowen. <coughs> taxes and insurance. It's the contract that, that, that varies. The taxes go up, their payment goes up. I've never, and I tell them this when we sit down, I've never once ever raised anyone's payment based on taxes because it's so minimal. However, I tell them we have it in there in case it ever goes up significantly. Like if there was a government change and all of a sudden it's $1,000 a month, some kind of crazy government law came out then it's $1,000 a month in taxes. So I say, that's why we have it in there, but I've never actually changed them. The insurance though, I do have them get their own policies now. We've changed that to where I have a, a local company now that will give them a homeowner's policy. So they get their own policy, so I don't have to mess with that anymore. Where you're labeled as additional insured. Additional insured, correct. Okay. That's crazy. That's over 178 houses, tax bills vary. That's a pretty sizable chunk of money that you're gonna, not, well, you're gonna have to pay out. It, it varies so minimal that I don't, I don't even think twice about it. We're, we, we do okay, so I don't, uh, I, don't, I don't even think twice about it. Now, if it went up significant and I, and I had to recalculate people, I would, but I don't, I don't even think about it. Because you think about how much taxes go up. They go up minimal. You're talking about $100, a couple hundred dollars, if, if that, and then you break that up between 12 months, and I'm like, so we're talking $10. And, uh, and mind you, you might say, oh, well, over 100 properties, you know, it's, it's of significance, but over the course of everything, I don't, I don't mess with it. I try and leave my people at as much peace as I can. I, you know, I generally tell them, I said, as long as you make your payment every month, you're never gonna hear from me again. And I wanna, and I stick to that. I'm like, listen, and I've had people, let me tell you something else, I've had people crush it on the buying end, and I want them to crush it. So sometimes people are like, well, aren't you mad? They just, I sold it to them for 89, and they just sold it for 249. And I'm like, no, I want them to crush it. Because guess what? Now they're calling, do you have anything else? Do you have anything else? They, and, and people are like, yeah, but you left that money on the table. I'm like, no, they, I bought it for 20. They renovated it. They paid on it for six years. They did all the work. They deserve to make the profit, right? They did the work. I am just the bank. Bank of America don't get mad if you flip a house and make money. I, and you have to disassociate yourself from that. Not, there's a saying I always tell people, don't count the money in another man's pocket, right? We worry about the money we make. We make what we agreed to make. I want them to make money. The more money everyone else makes, the more money that they're trying to help you make. I want everybody to make money in the transaction. So sometimes they make a lot, and I'm okay with that. I want them to make money. Cool. I know people that get mad at that. I have people that, with me that get mad at it, and they, they're like, oh, I'm, I'm trying to say this, or make it so they can't sell, or they want, and I'm like, listen, you're doing the wrong thing. You're fighting to keep dollars. Let them get the dollars. You're gonna make more money by giving away the money. And, I, and people don't understand that, and I always tell people, I say, try it. Just try it, and you're going to make more money by being generous than you are going to make by being greedy. And so I'm like, let them, let them make their money. Somebody, I, I, you got a light behind you, but I see a hand. Right there, my at the bar. Go ahead, brother. So, that's a, so the question was, how do we acquire the properties? And that is another four-hour event, but I'm going to give you some, some short answers. When you find a vacant property like that, one of the simple things you can do is skip trace. So try and find a phone number. If there's, in fact, a seller, we can send letters. We actually will put um, door hangers on, or we do sticky notes now that look like a UPS label. Um, we put a sticky note on. Um, you, can, you can send mailers to them. 
and you know that that's all you can really do if they want to sell they'll respond to you if they don't want to sell just because they own it just because it's vacant run down and all that doesn't mean they even want to sell some people will keep it till the day they die but um and, and that's all you can do is keep marketing to them we've even had times where we've this is you're gonna laugh when I say this where we've had this seller we know has to want to sell and we can't get in touch with them and we'll stick a for sale sign in their front yard knowing they're gonna call us pissed off but um and they do well, this is my house about, and I said, oh, no, you didn't see, there's a little question mark behind a for sale question mark. And um, we just do it to make them call us. We just do it so they would call. And then we tell them, no, 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 we were asking if it's for sale. We weren't saying it was for sale. And uh, because it'll make them call. But other than that, I mean, if they don't want to sell, you can't make them sell. Back in the bag, Susan. Uh, I actually bought your book in area. So that was a fantastic question. So she asked, do we only buy here in Hampton Roads? And if not, where else do we buy? So no, I buy everywhere now, where I primarily buy, and it doesn't have to be three, four hours away. So I had an epiphany a few years ago when I started, used I used to only buy here. When I started, I would only buy in Virginia Beach, then I would break into Norfolk, and then Portsmouth, and then I was like, okay, all seven cities. And it got to a point where I had houses, even local in Newport News, that I was like, I've never seen them, ever. I bought them, never saw them, filled them, never saw them, never saw them. So then it started dawning on me. I said, well, what's the difference if I have a house I've never seen, never been to here, or one across the country, right? And so that we started dabbling out. And so now we buy a lot out of the area. So I buy a lot in Missouri. Missouri's a state where the numbers are insane. When I tell you the numbers, and, and the first instinct when I tell you these numbers, you're going to be like, he's full of crap. And I say, well, listen, just Google it. You don't have to take my word for it. Just spend some time when you get home and Google it. We buy houses in Missouri, St. Louis area, $20,000, $15,000, $17,000. When you look at them, they're beautiful. Granite countertops, hardwood floors, garages. And I'm like, how? And then when you look at the comparable rents, $900 a month. I'm like, how is a house $900 a month and $17,000 purchase price? But it is. So in the beginning, I was like, it can't be, it can't be. There's got to be, I've been doing it for years now. And I was like, there's got to be something I don't know. And so I bought one and I said, well, let's test it for a year and see how it goes. Now I think I have 38 or 40 in St. Louis. I have in Illinois. I got guys in my group buy a lot in Indiana. They do Ohio. They do Alabama. Um, they're all over the place. Basically, any place where the numbers work, where we can pay them off in five years or less, mostly out there we do four-year mortgages instead of five because they're so cheap. Um, we'll do four-year mortgages out there. And then the other thing to that is it has to be a state that's landlord-friendly. And by that I mean, like, New York has areas that work, like upstate New York has areas that work. Now we have one person in our group who buys there, but that's because she lives there. But I advise people not to buy there because it could take you a year or more to do an eviction. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't buy in California, you wouldn't buy in Oregon, you wouldn't buy in, uh, in Washington. There's several states that they just, they treat investors poorly. So you wouldn't buy there regardless of the price points, right? But states that, that are landlord friendly, and long as the numbers work, we'll buy anywhere. Good one, good one. Any other questions we got before we let you guys get out of here? Go ahead, brother. Starting from zero, what will be your first deal? My you first deal. Today. So, so you, I know it's a, it's a loaded question. So I'm going to tell you the, the answer that people don't like. So the question was, if I was starting from zero, what would be your first deal? So my, my first thought would be to first pick a market, and this is the part people don't like. <coughs> first pick a market, and it could be local. It could be pick another state or wherever you want. Research the market. But then this is the part they don't like and this is what I train my people on, I tell them, look at 100 houses before you buy one. And it's hard on people because you might be on your third house and be like, it's a smoking deal. It's great. It's this and it's that and everything about it's great. The reason I say to look at 100 houses is because we're corrupt in our mind of what we see as a price point and see as value. And I did it myself. I bought, I bought houses for 30 grand that I now, knowing what I know now, should have been 20. But, but I was like, it's a smoking deal. It's all brick. It's got this, you know, it's, it's so nice. But because it was, I was dabbling in a new state and it seemed like a great deal. But that's why I tell you, I said, look at 100 houses, it's free to look. And once you look at 100 houses, you will know a deal when you see it. And then you don't have any issue. But too many people, the way people screw up is they, they dabble in a new market and they compare it to what they know here or wherever they are. And then everything's a smoking deal. You're like, this house is 17 grand. How could I lose? Right? And I'm like, well, if everything else is five grand, that's how you lose. And so I say, look at 100 houses, and then you'll know a deal, and then you'll buy with confidence because you'll be able to see the difference between a good deal and just the average price houses. 100 houses. If Don't get discouraged. Up, if the numbers add up to 17, you know you've got five, how are you losing? 
No, I was saying if they're worth five and you get it at 17, you don't lose. Like I have a bunch I bought at 30 and I realized that doing it all over again, I would have paid 20. I'm still wildly profitable at 30, don't get me wrong, but I don't want to spend money I don't have to spend. So yeah, I, the ones I bought that I, that I overpaid for, I still, I still sold them at 89, so I'm still wildly profitable on them, but I'd rather buy them at 20. <laughs> I could have just bought that many more. Well, this has been cool, guys. No other questions for Scott? Oh, you know, nobody else? How do we become part of the team? I would say to start off with exactly what he said and read the book. Read the book, and when you're done with the book, um, it'll give you an option to watch a free two-hour training, and that's the best place to start. Scott doesn't do training anymore. Yeah, I used to always do live local events. I stopped doing them now, and I'm trying to, uh, now we have people all over the country. I used to just do local. And so, I, I, and even when people ask like, they're like, I wanna join, I wanna sign up, I wanna get involved. I'm always like, listen, start with the book. And the reason I tell people to start that way is because when you read the book, some people are turned off by it and they don't want to do that. And, it, and you might be that way, you like your houses, right? So you may, you may read it and be like, no, I don't wanna do that. And that's okay, like I always, I always tell people, there's a million ways to make a million bucks, choose one. It doesn't have to be slow flips. But when you read the book, you will know if it is what resonates with you. Some people read it and they're like, this is what I'm doing with the rest of my life. They know right away, this is my future. And some people read it and they're like, nope, that's not what I'm doing. I like this and I wanna keep doing this. I like the burn, whatever they're into. And so that's why everybody's like, well, how do we join? I said, I don't want people to join until you read the book and then you'll get a full idea of whether or not it even resonates with you. Well, Scott, I, my mentor, another mentor of mine told me about 15 years ago, he's like, go to any city in the country. I know you even mentioned it yesterday. Is that what kind of helps you with the framing it up? Yeah. Do you want to explain that to him? You're talking about the tall bank buildings? The bank. Yeah, so I, I always, and I, and I use Mr. Burns from The Simpsons as my example, just so people can have a visualization in their head. But, um, but I always say, I say, I say, you can go to any tall building in any city, and they have bank names on the side. And I always say, you visualize Mr. Burns from The Simpsons, if you guys know him, with his hands like this, and he's basically telling us, run along, run along, and, and we're doing it. We're, run along, and we do all the work, we collect all the money, we deal with all the headaches, and as soon as we get it, we send it to him. Yeah. And he's literally just sitting there waiting, and we're doing all the work. And, and I, th I base my whole business on that, because what we've done is we flipped it all on its head to where we are Mr. Burns. We're the ones sitting now, and we're waiting, they're doing the work, they're doing eviction, they're doing the repairs, they're doing the for rent, they're doing the showings, they're doing all that work, and then when they collect the money, it gets mailed to us. And so that is, that is what I love about it. That's the whole, in my head, that's the whole way I see the entire thing. I'm good with it. Okay, Scott, thank you. I don't see any more questions. Make sure you network, go to slowflip.com forward slash Haskins event. I see some players in the room, guys. Get to know somebody else that's in here. Uh, anything you want to leave with, Scott? Do something today your future self is going to thank you for. That's it. Up.